It should not just be all formal, but we give God the praise for the opportunity of being in his presence today. We thank God for the life that he has given unto us and everything that he is doing in our lives. We give him all the praise. We give him all the adoration. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the glorious one of Israel, the mighty one of Jacob. We thank God for the opportunity of coming before in his presence today. Praise the Lord. How many of you are happy to be in God's presence? Amen. How many of you are happy to be in God's presence? Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayers before we get into the message. In Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We bless your name. We worship you. We give you praise. We give you all the adoration. There is none like unto you. There is none that can be compared with you. You are Alpha. You are the Omega. You are the first, you are the last, the soon coming king. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for how you have blessed us thus far in the time of prayers, oh God, even this morning, in the time of the praise and worship, Lord, we give you thanks for how you are encouraging us in every aspect of our lives. We say that you will receive all the praise and all the adoration in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we pray today that your word, oh God, will be spirit to us, that it will be life to us, oh God. Any aspect of our lives, O oh God, that is dead, we pray, O oh God, that by your spirit today that you, O oh God, will bless us indeed in Jesus' name. Father, Lord, we are praying that you will visit us in a mighty way, that you will speak to our souls. Father, Lord, even at this time, I hide myself behind the cross, and I pray that, Lord, that you will speak through me. Father, Lord, we pray that you will even have your way in our lives. As we get into the word of liberty, Lord, we pray that we'll be liberated in Jesus' name. As we get into your word today, Lord, we pray that you will be delivered, O oh God, by your word. And we're saying that you will have your way in our lives in Jesus' name. Be thou exalted and be thou glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We've been studying a lot about purpose. In fact... With all the messages that we've studied here on purpose, we could write several books. Praise the Lord. And um, the topic of today's message that I'm going to look at is God's encouragement for you and your purpose. This wasn't the message that I actually prepared originally, but, you know, whenever you're serving God and whenever you are, you know, preparing for messages, you just have to be attentive to the Holy Spirit as you are praying. And um, God nudged me to, to this message, God's encouragement for you and your purpose. We see a lot of things that are, I'll read the text, but we see a lot of things going on in the world, not only in the world, but even in our own individual lives. Sometimes life throws us curveballs that, you know, that we're not expecting. And if every single one of us would sit down and start saying some of the things that you know, we have gone through or maybe we are going through, you know, it would be a story in itself. So, but God is telling us that even when we're passing through the fire, through the waters, just like the, 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 the young men, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were in that fire, there was a fourth person there. And that was, I believe, the Lord Jesus. So in whatever situation that we're going through in life, the Lord is there with us, and he doesn't want us to be afraid. He doesn't want us to fear because he is there with us. God's encouragement for you and your purpose. Like I said, we've been talking about purpose. By now, like I said, we could, we could write books about purpose. But God wants you to know that he is there for you. He is with you in every situation, every circumstance, everything that you're passing through in your life. I'll read the text and then I will delve into the book of Nahum. How many of you know where Nahum is? <laughs> oh, that, that amen stopped short. Uh, praise the Lord. It's a book that a lot of times many of us don't go to. Um, who knows where it is? Uh, who said, oh, after before Micah, okay, praise the Lord. It's in the Old Testament, but it's a, a lot of a lot of times many preachers don't 
They don't go there. There are some books, a lot of pictures. I don't know if they shy away from it or something like that. Zephaniah, Micah, Habakkuk, you know, the minor prophets and all that. But like I said, God led me to Nahum. I started studying Nahum and he gave us some messages from there. Praise the Lord. But I'll read Isaiah chapter 41. I, everybody should know where Isaiah is. Right? Okay, praise the Lord. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. The Bible says there, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, fear not, for I am... It says what? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I thought I would have heard amen. I'm shouting. I might not be shouting it on the mic, but I'm shouting it in my heart. Praise the Lord. He says, I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And in Isaiah 40 verse 1, the Bible says that. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says God. God is here. He's the great, Holy Spirit is the great comforter. And he will comfort us in all our situations. In Jesus' name. The book of Nahum, it, it offers a, a compelling narrative of the imminent downfall fall of the city of Nineveh and God's righteous judgment upon it. Nineveh is um, present-day Mosul in Iraq. That's where it is. Um, and it was under the Assyrian Empire, and they did some things to the children of Israel, and eventually the judgment of God came upon them, if you read the whole book of Nahum. And actually, the name Nahum or Nahum, um, it means encouragement. Praise the Lord. It means encouragement. It means comfort. And he brought comfort to the children of Israel, even though they were passing through different kinds of uh, um, you know, oppressions from the children of uh, from the people of Assyria in those days. So like I said, life sometimes can throw you some curveballs that you're not expecting, you know. Everybody needs encouragement. If anybody tells you that they don't need encouragement, they're lying. Because even Jesus himself needed encouragement. Jesus is God, but he was learning how to live in his creation, which is the body that we are wearing like a suit right now. You know, he came into the flesh and he had to learn how to live <laughs> in this flesh. And he needed encouragement. And we can even see that. We'll see that in the Bible, you know. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, you know, after the, dev after the devil left him, and behold, the angels were ministering to him. They came to minister. They came to encourage him because of all the things that he was going through and all that. And a lot of times, many of us, you know, we're going through some things. We're going through some things that weigh us down, things that bother us, you know, in the pursuit of purpose. We've been talking about purpose, 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 purpose. We might even be dreaming about purpose, 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 purpose in our dreams and all that. But as you're doing all that, you're still living life, 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 life. And with life comes problems. Just like when you were born, first thing you did, you cried. They spanked your I'm not going to use the word here, but, but they spanked you, and uh, you let out that first cry. Say, why, 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 did, why, should I, why should I leave the shores of heaven and come here on earth? And then you are here. So anyone, everyone needs encouragement. Don't be Pinocchio's brother, brother or sister. If you say you don't need encouragement, you're lying. Everybody needs encouragement. Even Jesus himself, like I said, needed encouragement. Paul needed encouragement, too. Paul in Acts chapter 27 and verse 23 needed encouragement. You know, for this very night, chapter 27 and 23 says, For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And the angel of the Lord encouraged him because of what he was going through in that particular time. Elijah needed encouragement. So many people in the Bible, I can't read all of them, but we see Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 5 to 8. And the Bible says that he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked 
on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So God will encourage his people through the downfall of our enemies in Jesus' name. God will encourage you through the downfall of your opposition. Anything that is opposing you, God will encourage you through the downfall of your obstacles and challenges. Anything that is set before you that is a pitfall, that is a, pit, that's a, that is a, as a hole, God will use those things by eliminating them. He will encourage us in Jesus' name. I'm going to look at three points in this message. The first one is be at the center of your purpose. Second point is God's encouragement for your purpose. And the third point is good news for you and your purpose. So let's get at it. So be at the center of your purpose. God wants us to be in alignment, you know, with his God-given purpose. Every single one of us seated down here, we have a purpose. We have a reason for existence. God wrote a manual for your life and when he created you for a specific reason so you are important to god you are not um, insignificant a lot of times america looks at every single one of us as numbers it's almost like um, slave camp or you know the egyptians in those days building the pyramids and all that they look at you as a number if you fall they replace you if you're in a company right now, if you, if God forbid, I'm not praying that anybody gets laid off or anything like that, but if you're not in that position anymore, what happens? Will the company stop because of you? No. They get another person and they replace you. So, but to God, you are very, very, very important. Just like Pastor was talking about last week. When God is building, Jesus is the foundation. And if you look to that little corner there, you might not see the bricks, but there are bricks on the other side of the curtain. They're interlocking. So if you take out one of them, you see outside. Or if it's not outside, you see the foundation. And with time, you might come to church and things are running around here. So because of that little gap, if you take and pastor will freak out and say, what's going on, DJ? What's going on? Why is there a hole there? Let's get it fixed. So every single person in the body of Christ is important. You are unique, and you are different, and you are important. Nobody can take your place. You can't say, take the block from the top part and put it at the bottom. If you put it at the bottom, what happens to the top? It's open, or it collapses. So just like you build a domino, when you tip one, what happens? All of them tips like that. So Everybody is important in God, and you need to see yourself as unique. You are here for a specific purpose. You are here for a specific reason. If you can't accomplish that reason, it doesn't mean that God might have other people that could do what you do, but you would have missed a lot because God made you for a specific reason. So we need to recall that when God selects, calls, and, equi and equips, he assures us of his perpetual presence and support. He is there to help us. That's what we saw in Isaiah 41 and verse 10. It says, fear not, for I am with you. He said, I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. He didn't say trouble won't come. Trouble will come. He didn't say that you're not going to pass through the waters. When, a lot of times when you, you give your life to Christ, everybody might say, oh, it's going to be all rosy. But when you get that rose, a lot of ladies love roses, especially Valentine's Day, you get roses. But if you're not holding that rose very well, what's going to happen to you? The thorns. So that's how life is. It's beautiful. God made it beautiful, but he allows some of those trials, you know, to come to us, to buffet us. Why does he do that? So he can make us better. You know, God made you a lump of gold. But remember, gold has impurities. For you to take away the impurities, you have to put it through fire. And what happens to gold when you put it through fire? It becomes more pure, and it comes out the best. So when you're going through life's problems and you're accomplishing your purpose, remember, 
God sometimes will take you and he's going to throw you inside that fire. And you'll cry and say, oh, God, oh, my God, are you existing? Where are you? He's right there. And he's the one with the tongs. You know, when you're, when you're purifying gold, you have to hold the gold. And as the fire is burning it, you turn it. And then he's not even done. After he brings you out and you're glowing red with anger because he put you inside that fire, he will take a hammer and slam your head. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. How many of you have watched Forged in Fire? Forged in Fire on Netflix, anyone? I watch it, the making of knives, <laughs> praise the Lord. So they'll take the bar of, and they'll slam it. He said, God, what are you doing? He's shaping you into the best form. The plan that he had for you, he wanted you to come out to be a battle axe. He wanted you to come out to be a sword. He wanted you to come, come out to be a ninja sword so that he can kill the enemy and all that. But he's going to deal with you first. He's not going to leave you as a lump of clay or a lump of iron. He's going to mold you into what you need to become. So he is there. So we see that in scriptures. Second Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 7. It says, but you take courage. Do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. God will reward you through everything that you're going through in Jesus' name. For I know. Why? Because he says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, he says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans of welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. He wants you to have a future. He wants you to have a glorious hope, a golden hope, so that when they tell the stories, you know, all of you are a book. You know, when we get to heaven, I told God, I want to be the librarian of heaven. So you've lost that position. You're not getting it. I'm getting it. Praise the Lord. We're going to be reading stories about all the great things we did for God here on earth. What are you doing for God? Ask yourself those questions. So your unique purpose is divinely ordained by God. And within this sacred purpose, you are fortified by his ceaseless support and guidance. God is always there to support. He's always there to guide. Find yourself at the center of your purpose. Sing the song. At the center of it all. I'm not going to sing. It's you that I see. So find yourself at the center of your purpose. Because at the center of your purpose, God is there. Praise the Lord. Second point, God's encouragement for you. You know, there are two major parts. You know, there's two major parts to God's encouragement, the way I divided it. You know, they are. The first one is God will ensure the punishment of those who oppose your purpose. When you are at the center of your purpose, you are at the center of God's eye. You are the apple of his eye. Inside your eyes, there's a little hole in the middle that looks like a hole. It's a whole, I don't know. People in medicine will know better, but you are the apple of God's eye. And if you oppose anybody that, you know, that opposes you, opposes your purpose, God will ensure that they get punished and he will destroy them. If you fight against God, your story will be like that of Pharaoh. He said, the second point is that you can rest your purpose on God's sovereignty. What sovereignty? You can rest your purpose on God's authority, God's power, God's rule, God, uh, God's omnipotence, righteousness, and justice. That is where you can rest your purpose on because God never changes. And he's all powerful to make you to become what he has created you to become. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll jump into that first point. I divided the second part of the message. It's God's encouragement for you, for your purpose. And that is when we're going to delve into the book of Nahum to see how God encouraged the children of uh, Israel when they were dealing with um, the Assyrians and Nineveh and all the stuff that they were doing in those days. So the first point is God will ensure the punishment of those who oppose you and your purpose. Everything in all creation is subject to the sovereign power of God. God is in control of everything. Everything that is happening, it is not happening and God is, you know, is taking God on away. No, it's not. Everything is according to God's timing. He knows everything. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He knows every single thing that is going. He is sovereign. He has all power and he's everywhere. He will ensure the punishment of those who oppose him. Why? Why will he ensure that? 
Let's look at some points. God is jealous. You know why? I, it's good to listen to God. Because as Bro Benga was praying this morning, I was writing down, I, there's an envelope I put in my bag. I was writing down some of the things he was saying because those are the things I had in my message. I didn't discuss with Bro Benga. That's why I said I had already prepared another message for today. But as I was praying, God started nudging me towards this message. And as I was hearing him pray, I was saying, okay, God, I thank you because you're confirming what you have said. Bro Benga, I didn't call you, so we didn't plan it. Praise the Lord. So God will ensure the punishment of those who oppose you and your purpose. So everything is subject to God's sovereign power. He will ensure that the punishment of those that oppose him. And why is that? The first point is that God is jealous or zealous over you and your purpose. He is jealous. And the word there, jealousy, is not from the human perspective of jealousy. Human perspective of jealousy comes from an evil place. You see somebody doing good, you are wishing evil for the person. You are jealous because of what they have. You are coveting what they have. You don't have it because of that you become jealous. Not God. His jealousness, or the way the translators translated it, they said he's zealous for you. Because he wants to wor he wants you to worship him and he wants all your worship he doesn't share with no person. Praise the Lord. So God is jealous or zealous over you and your purpose. Nahum chapter am I pronouncing it well? Is it Nahum or Nahum? Nahum? <laughs> Sounds funny, but Nahum, Nahum, whatever it is, you know what it is. Nahum, Nahum chapter one and verse. Two, the Bible says that the Lord is jealous. It's a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. So be encouraged to know, because the message is what? That um, God's encouragement for you and your purpose. It says be encouraged to know. That God zealously guards the welfare of his people and fiercely desires their faithfulness. It's not only that he's zealous and jealous over you. He wants your faithfulness to him and him alone. So our worship must be to God and to God alone. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 to verse 5. The Bible says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Or any, li or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under, under the earth. For you shall n not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Don't hate God. Because if you hate him, you <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> you you have to you have to deal with him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 and verse 24. The Bible says, Take care. Lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Our God is a jealous God. He is jealous over you and over your purpose. He took time to actually write the code of your purpose that made you who you are. And he wants you to accomplish it so you can come back to your beginning. Your beginning is that you came from him. He sent you here for a purpose, just like Jesus was sent for a purpose. And you are sent here for a reason. And every day you wake up, it's an opportunity to accomplish that reason. So every day you wake up and you don't devote yourself to God, you're wasting your time. And that purpose will not be accomplished because you are not focusing on it. God wants you to discover what it is, go to him. He wants you to come to him and sup with him and dine with him and get to know yourself better. The more you know God, the more you know yourself. The farther you move away from God, the farther you move away from the reality of yourself. So the closer you get to God, the closer you discover who you really are and what you are here to accomplish. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord 
is one. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm not going to read all that part. Chapter 2 verse 1 to all the way to chapter 3. But I'm going to summarize. I'm going to read my summary. It says the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah instructing him to remind Israel of their past devotion to God. Especially during their times in the wilderness. God then speaks of Israel subsequent turning away their idolatries and their disloyalty. Despite this, God calls Israel to return and to repent. The passage portrays the profound relationship between God and Israel and God's longing for their faithfulness. God longs for your faithfulness. He desires your faithfulness. He desires a relationship with you. So the further you're moving away from God, you're being disloyal to him. The further you move away from God and pursue other things, all those other things become idols in your lives. And God doesn't deal with idolatry. Anything, you know, what's idolatry? Idolatry is not, you have, you know how they do in cartoons. They set up a little effigy and people go and, and it's not just that. Anything can be your idol. Your idol is anything you worship. What is worship? Worship is not just singing. I was thinking about it all week. Worship is not just coming to sing. And worship is your life. What you dedicate your life to is what you worship. What you dedicate, that's your life is worship. We worship something. Everybody worships something. Worship is not just, oh, praise the Lord, you dance and do all that, you know, choir. I'm, no, no offense, please. It's not just that. Worship is you. You worship something. It might not be, you either worship God or you worship the devil. There's no gray area. It's just God and whatever is there. The devil and his cohorts. That's it. So worship is your lifestyle. Worship is your words. Worship is your actions. Worship is your thoughts. Worship is your company. Worship is your habit. Watch yourself. Jesus said watch and pray. That's the word watch. Words, action, thoughts, company, and habits. That is you. You are worship. You worship whatever you believe in. Whatever is number one in your life is what you will worship. And you see it in the things you do, the things you say, the thoughts you think, the company you keep and the habits that control your life. That is your worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God's vengeance and rage are not motivated by petty stuff. He's not evil. His vengeance and rage is motivated by holiness. It's motivated by justice. It's motivated by faithfulness. I might just go through some scriptures, but I'm going to skip some. But you can read this. His Vengeance and rage is motivated by holiness. You can see that in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 28 to 29. I'm not going to read. Um, it's motivated by justice. Isaiah chapter 63 from verse 1 to 9. It's motivated by faithfulness and the covenant with his people. Leviticus chapter 26, 23 to 25. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 24 to verse 26. So it is heartening to, you know, recognize that our God you know, ardently defends our purpose. He is there to defend our purpose. His zealous nature, zealous nature, expressed through his protection of his people ensures our purposes are not destroyed. You know, your purpose will not be thwarted in Jesus' name. It will not be destroyed in Jesus' name. So what do we learn from this point that God is zealous over us? God's zealous commitment to his people ensures their divinely ordained purpose remains unshaken, supported by his holiness, justice, and covenant faithfulness. So God is zealous over you, and he wants you to accomplish the purpose that he has for your life. Praise the Lord. So the second point, like I said, I divided the, the part B into diff uh, different parts. The first part is that God will ensure the punishment of those who oppose you and your purpose. And we looked at the first one, that God is jealous or zealous over you and your purpose. The second one under that particular point is that God is patient over you and your purpose. You know, a lot of times we say, Jesus, come, come, come. He's going to come. Don't get me. He's going to come. But if Jesus, ask yourself that question. 
If Jesus came five years ago, would you have made it? Ask yourself that question. If Jesus came even one year ago or two years ago, would you have made it? So a lot of times we should not think that, you know, because he has not come or anything like that, that his patience, his slackness is not. Let's look at Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says, the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. We need to be encouraged that God's patience, you know, with disobedience resonates with his faithful love. That we see God keeping quiet when a lot of things are going on doesn't mean that he is not cognizant of it. He's just allowing people so that people can repent from their evil ways. Because the lamb that came and was slain is not coming back as a lamb next time around. He's coming back as the reigning king. We will see another nature of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. He's not coming back as a lamb. He's not coming back, you know, the Bible says that he was meek, lowly. He's not coming back like that. He's coming back a reigning king and he's going to destroy a lot of stuff. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6. The Bible says there, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God, God is loving. He is so loving that he's so patient with us. We can also see that in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty. What does that mean? He's not... He's not going to let sin pass. He already paid the price of sin. And the price of sin was himself. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So he's not going to let the guilty pass because you have an opportunity to repent. Because you're hearing these words if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or if you are not truly worshiping God. Because worship like we have seen is your lifestyle. If you are not embedded in Jesus and Jesus is embedded in you, this is the time. The patient time, the time that we're waiting for Jesus to come back, is that time that is for you to change. Because when you will see him, it's not going to be, uh, it's going to be either praise and worthy because we accepted Jesus and we are walking into his presence and we are happy about it. Or we were living another life and we cannot clear the guilty because that's what the Bible says there. He will not clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and to the fourth generation. He is merciful. He is patient. Psalm chapter 103 and verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, and rend your hearts and not your garments. He's asking us to return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Thank God that God is none of us. Because sometimes when we get angry, man, it's like, whoa. Nothing will stand against him. You are a tornado. You are, in fact, the United States should just employ you as one of their ballistic missiles and put you in a silo somewhere in Antioch, uh, Antioch, California, and bury you in the ground because when they need to attack any person, release the Kraken, and he bounces <laughs> out with its uh, forks and knives and everything, and he attacks the enemy, and they say, where did they get this one from? Praise the Lord. But thank God God is not us. Because if God is us, we'll be in trouble. Praise the Lord. Because some of the bad things and bad stuff we do, if any of us had the position of God, as soon as you say, Zeus, thunder. And then the thunder pierces the person's head and you forget about the person. He's gone, vaporized, and all that. So God is merciful and he's kind. He's abounding in love, but... Just know he's not going to clear the guilty. He's already paid the price of guilt, and that's Jesus. So God's patience is a testament to his profound love for us. However, you must never take his patience for granted. As it's written in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. That is God. He's patient towards all of us. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, or do you presume, do you presume... 
on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience. We should not just take God for granted. So what do we learn from this point? The point that we were looking at is that God is patient over you and your purpose. He's patient over us and our purpose. And what do we learn even from, from this? What do we learn from this? We learn that God's enduring patience emanates from his boundless love and faithfulness, yet it should never be misconstrued as leniency towards unrepentant wrongdoing. Praise the Lord. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So the second point of the second point, which is you can rest your purpose on God's sovereignty, righteousness, and just justice. We can take our purpose and we can rest this on his authority. We can rest this on his righteousness. He's dependable. And we can rest this on his justice. The fact that we can rest on his sovereignty, righteousness, and justice is a great encouragement to us. Why? Why is this a great encouragement to us? First point here, I'm still in the second point of the message. We're looking at the encouragement of God from the perspective of Nahum and how he comforted the children of Israel when they were under attack even from, from the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, in, in, those, in those days. So first point here is God is good over you and your purpose. He is good over you and your purpose. Let's look at Nahum chapter 1 and verse uh, 7a. Chapter 1 and verse 7a. The Bible says that the Lord, I'll read the whole verse, but you'll see that part. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. I like how NLT put it. It says the Lord is good, a strong refuge for uh a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is also close to those who trust him. So the Lord is good. God is good over you and your purpose. And that is an encouragement to us. So we need to be encouraged because he acts equitably towards everyone. God shows no partiality. There's no partiality in God. The same way he treats you is the same way he will treat another person. You cannot say he loves one person more than the other person. You know, the more we invest time, the more we draw close to God, the more. God is not an AI. God is God. He's a person. The more you draw close to the person, the more the person draws close to you. Just like um, uh, people that are trying to get married, the more you get to know the other person, the more the other person gets to know you. And then you, you know, talk about and get to know each other and all that. That's the same thing with God. So God is good. He is good to us, he's good to you, and he's good to you, and also your purpose. So we need to be encouraged because he treats everyone equitably. There's no partiality in him, especially those that are at the center of, you know, their purposes and those that are at the center of his will. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. The Bible says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Take refuge in the Lord in Jesus' name. Psalm chapter 100 and verse 5. The Bible says, for the Lord is good. I thought someone would have said amen. I say amen. The Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Only our generation? No. Only on earth? Ah. Oh. Uh, there was a, there was a, what do you call it, a, a hesitation there. Uh, praise the Lord. Not only on earth. We don't know. There might be other earths. I always think about it. You know, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His goodness on the pines. I didn't want to go there. Because if I go there, I'm going to sci-fi, sci Star Trek, and all that. Praise the Lord. His goodness on the pines, every facet of our lives. Trusting in his goodness ensures we are divinely positioned within our purpose, experiencing his benevolence and mercy. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So we are looking at, and we are saying that God is good over you. God is good over you. He's good over your purpose. He is there to bless you. So he's good to us. And what is the lesson, like the nugget that I derived from all these lessons is that God's unwavering goodness anchors our purpose. Offering a sanctuary in adversity and recognizing those who seek his shelter. Praise the Lord. The Lord will recognize us in Jesus' name. Second point here is that God is a refuge 
over you and your purpose. He's a refuge over you and your purpose. In that Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7, we see in the second part of it, it says, a stronghold, Nahum 1, 7 b, it says, a stronghold in the day of what? Trouble. A stronghold in the day of trouble. A strong refuge when trouble comes. Trouble will come in everybody's life. You can't run away from it. Trouble will come. But what refuge do you have? God is a strong refuge when trouble comes. And that is an encouragement to us. God is a refuge over you and your purpose. And we can say that boldly. Why? Because in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 2, the Bible says that the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horns of my salvation, my stronghold. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll shake the hands of David when I get to heaven. Praise the Lord. Psalm chapter 62, verse 5 to 7, the Bible says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation. We can rest our salvation, our purpose, our lives on God. And my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Who is your refuge? It's supposed to be God. Praise the Lord. So God is a, is a refuge over you and over your purpose like we have seen. Um, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. Proverbs 18 and verse 10. The Bible says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous man runs into it and is safe. Will be safe in Jesus' name. Psalm chapter 20 and verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in intercontinental ballistic missiles and all that. But God, God is greater than all those things are nothing to him. You know, those are like grains of salt before him. You know, yeah, it will level the whole place and give you a big mushroom, but that will tell you how big God is and how powerful he is. All those things are nothing to him. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, some trust in all their weapons and guns and all those kind of things, but we trust in the name of our Lord. You can come out with all those things and God will say, hey, you, pick up that little rock there and sling it and Goliath all comes down and you go there and take that weapon and cut up Goliath's head. Praise the Lord. That's the God that we serve. You know, God does some things that today, when we look at physics and math and all that, we'll say, man, this is so stupid. You know, he says, go sing. Walk around the whole city. Sing, sing, sing on the seventh day. Is it seventh day? On the seventh day, you know, scream. And people will say, oh my God, these guys are stupid. But after you do that, he levels Jericho. You know, or sometimes they say, okay, we're going to war. You know, you amass all the troops at the border and all that. You know, and God help them. You know, you amass all the troops and all that. God said, ah, army is too big. I don't need 300,000 people. I just want, maybe, let's go with a thousand. So he can make it more stupid. So that when he beats the, oh, praise the Lord. Let's continue. Praise the Lord. God anchors, God anchors our purpose during life's turbulent storm, shielding those whose faith is in him. The Lord will shield us in Jesus' name. Third point, under the second point of the second point, whoo, God is close to you and your purpose. He's so close to you. He's so close to you. God is so close. He's so close. You know, we live in a physical world, but we also live in a spiritual world. He's so close to you. I'm serious. He is. You know, maybe we need to pray. That, oh, pray that God opens your eyes so you see what we're working against. You know, because whenever Elisha prayed for Gehazi and God opened his eyes, he said, okay, I'm confident now. I'm not afraid of you guys. Whatever. You know, come at it. Get it. You know, come get me and all that because he saw who he was with. Praise the Lord. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 7c. God is close to you and your purpose. 
The Lord is good. I'm going to read the whole verse. It says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. I like the way NLT put it. I know we might not have NLT up there, but he says, he is close to those who trust in him. If you trust in the Lord, he's close to you. If you trust and believe in him. In fact, faith is like a magnet. It draws God. You know, it draws God. Jesus Christ, when Jesus, you know, Jesus is so fun. When Jesus was here on earth, you know, when the person say, oh, okay, let, let's go, okay, let's go to your house. Let me go heal the person and say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a man of authority. You know, you understand authority, but you can just say the word and my servant will be healed. He looks at his disciples and says, oh, my goodness. You know, faith makes God go wow. You know, it makes him go wow when you believe in him, when you trust in him above all else. So he looked at his disciples and said, I've never seen such a great faith. At that time, what happened? The servant was healed. Praise the Lord. In, may the Lord help us increase our faith in Jesus' name. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 1. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 1. Um, verse 10. Psalm chapter 9 and verse 10. And those who know their God, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 10. It says, the name of the Lord, what? It's a, it's a strong tower, and the righteous man runs into it, and they're safe. James chapter 4 and verse 8, the Bible says what? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 2 says, when you pass through what? When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame, and you shall not be consumed. He isn't a distant God. Sometimes we say, we're worshiping God. Oh, he's so far away. Above the galaxy, so far. God is not far. God is there. He's so close. He's so close. He's so close. I don't know why I'm saying that, but he's so close. He's there. He's right there with you in your house. You know, when you woke up that morning, he might have been sitting at the, at the foot of your bed and all that. He is there. Praise the Lord. He's in a distant God. In challenges, trust God. Trust that God's presence anchors our purpose and shields us from drawing us ever closer to him. God is always drawing us ever closer to him. God will protect you and your purpose. That's the next point that I have. God will protect you and your purpose. Let's see what he's, he did in Nahum chapter 1 verse 8 to 10. The Bible says that Nahum chapter 1 verse 8 to 10. He says, but with an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries. Amen. He's going to destroy adversaries in Jesus' name and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What do you plot against the Lord? He will make a complete end. Trouble will not rise up. Affliction, that's King James, will not arise the second time. For they are like entangled thorns, like drunkards as they drink. They are consumed like stubble, uh, like like stubble fully dry. Praise the Lord. God will protect you and your purpose. He will protect you and your purpose in Jesus. And we should be encouraged about that. Because God will protect you and your purpose from all your enemies. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, And the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Their plans against you will fail in Jesus' name. Psalm chapter 21 verse 11, the Bible says, For they intended evil against you. They devised a plan which they are not able to perform. They will not perform it in your life in Jesus' name. Psalm chapter 33 and verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. People should be saying amen. Because when I was reading this, I was saying amen to these scriptures because they are all prophecies. And if you say amen, it will be your portion in Jesus' name. Job chapter 5 verse 12 to 13. The Bible says he frustrates the devices of the crafty, so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and schemes of the willy are brought to a quick end. Praise the Lord. The Lord will do these things in our lives in Jesus' name. We are assured of divine protection when we align ourselves uh, with our purpose. No scheme of the enemy will prosper in your life in Jesus' name. What do we learn from this? Aligned with our purpose under God 
No adversary's plot stands a chance. For divine protection ensures their schemes will come to naught in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Fifth point. God will remove evil counselors. God will remove evil counselors and be a wonderful counselor to you and your purpose. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible says, For you, for from you came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. All what next counselors will fall in Jesus' name in your life. Who is in your ear? Who's in your ear? Who's counseling you? Who's in your ear? Who's in your ear? Evil counsel will ruin you. You see the division of the nations of Israel. First Kings chapter 12. I'm not reading because of our time. First Kings chapter 12 from verse 1 to 24. We see Rehoboam. Rehoboam was advised by his father's counselors that this is what you need to do and these people will serve you forever. He said no. I'm going to go to the young men. He listened to them and he came and told them. What, and at the end of the day, what happened? Israel split. There was Israel's side and there was Judah because of failing to listen to counsel. We see the evil counsel of Sennacherib. When Sennacherib, the king of Assyria in those days, sent his counselors, Rabshakeh, and they came out and they spoke to the children of Israel, insulting them and insulting them. Hezekiah took what they said, went into the presence of God, laid it down. At the end of the day, when you read the story of it, at the end of the day, that Sennacherib, God, one angel came into the camp of the Assyrians and slew 185,000 people in one night. When everybody woke up, they saw dead bodies everywhere. And when they saw all those dead bodies, they, the, the king said, let's go home. They went home immediately. And as soon as he got home, God said, I'm not done with you. Two of his kids went there and slaughtered him. And the third kid became king. Praise the Lord. Evil counsel is very bad. Who's in your ear? Evil counsel will destroy your life. It will destroy your relationship. It will destroy your career. It will destroy your destiny. First Kings chapter 12, I'm rounding up. First Kings chapter 12 and verse 7. And they said to him, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and speak good words, that's what the counselors of Rehoboam were telling him, and speak good words to them. When you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Praise the Lord. Who are you listening to? Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 22. Without counsel, plans fail. And with many advisors, they succeed. So be encouraged that Jesus is the wonderful counselor. And he is here to dine and to sup with you. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. And he's standing right there at the door of our hearts. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door of, at the door and knock. If anyone hears, if it's conditional, you can choose not to hear. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Who is in your ear? Be cautious of those who you allow to advise you. You know, it's very crucial. Open the door of your heart and let the wonderful counselor in. What do we learn from this? Embrace Jesus. Embrace Jesus, the wonderful counselor, for divine guidance and be discerning about the voices that you allow to influ influence your destiny. What you allow, what you hear, is what will influence your destiny. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. God will break every yoke of bondage over you and your purpose. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 13. And now I will break his yoke from off you and will burst your bonds apart. Praise the Lord. God is delivering us from bondage in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. We need to be encouraged because God will release you from bondage in Jesus' name. God will break the yoke of bondage from off your neck in Jesus' name. And why will he break this? Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 27, the Bible says, And in that day, in that day, his burden will be depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be broken because of the anointing. Some versions say, because of the fat. Praise the Lord. Because of the anointing oil. Praise the Lord. Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 17. But in Mount Zion there shall 
there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy and the house of jacob shall possess their possessions praise the lord freedom is our inheritance in jesus name so through god's anointing every yoke of bondage is shattered in jesus name granting us true freedom and reclaiming our divine inheritance last point under this point praise the lord god will judge all i know i'm taking your time god will judge all our enemies all the enemies against you and against your purpose Nahum chapter 1 and verse 14 the bible says the lord has given commandments about you no more shall your name be perpetuated praise the lord for the house of your gods i will cut off the calf image and the metal image I will make your I will make your grave. He's speaking to our enemies in Jesus' name. For you are vile. So be encouraged that God will judge our, all our enemies in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication from me declares the Lord. Rest assured, rest assured. Every opposing force, every obstacle, every challenge in our lives, God is judging them today in Jesus' name. God's authoritative judgment will dismantle every adversarial force in your life, ensuring your divine purpose thrives unsupposed so what have we learned here god will ensure the punishment of those who oppose you in jesus name god is jealous over you god is patient over you god is jealous over you over your life god is a refuge over you and your purpose god is close to you god will protect you god will remove every counselors from you god will break every yoke of bondage from all of, of you and god will judge all your enemies in jesus name good news is for you and your purpose is sure just like we saw in isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1 and Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1 that says comfort. God is bringing comfort to your life. God is giving comfort to your destiny. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 15. It says, Behold, upon the mountains, the feet of him who bring good news, who, pub who publishes peace. God is bringing good news in your life. Praise the Lord. Stand on your feet. God is bringing you good news in your life. God is bringing good news in your situation. God is bringing good news in everything that pertains unto you. Because of what? Because the Bible says, fear not, for I am with you. Isaiah 41 and verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. He did not say, I shall help you. He said, I will help you. That is a must. You can hold God to his word. And today you can open your mouth. Instead of looking at me, start looking unto God and say, God, help me today. Open your mouth and make that a prayer. He said, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When God stands as a cornerstone of your purpose, a life filled with divine favor and abundance of good news will become your perpetual destiny. Open your mouth and pray and say, Father, help me. You said that you will help me, O oh God. Help me, O oh God. Help me, O oh God. Father, Lord, we are praying that you will help us in the name of Jesus. We are praying that you will help us in the name of Jesus. Lord, you said that we should not fear, O oh God. You said, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, Lord. We seek for your strength today. We are praying that you will strengthen us in any way that we have faltered in you, O oh God. We are praying that you will strengthen our faith, O oh God. Build up our most holy faith as we come before in your presence. Father, Lord, we are praying for your help. Help us in every aspect of our lives. Help us in our situations. Help us in our career. Help us in every aspect of our lives. All the desires of our hearts, we are praying that you will help us. Help us in our relationships, O oh God. Bless us, O oh God. Father, Lord, you say that you will uphold us. Uphold us. Begin to make that your prayer today and say, Father, uphold me. Father, uphold me. Keep me till the last day. Keep me till the day that I will see your face. Say, Father, uphold me. Father, uphold me. Open your mouth and begin to talk to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are praying everlasting for the Lord that you may help us in the name of Jesus as we have come before in your presence. Uphold us, O oh God. Uphold us, O oh God. Uphold our souls, O oh God. Uphold our spirits, O oh God. 
Upon our minds, oh God. Upon our words, oh God. Upon our actions, oh God. Upon our thoughts, oh God. Upon everything that pertains to us as we have come before in your presence, oh God. Upon us, oh God, even today. Father Lord, we are praying that you will help us. Upon us as we have come before in your presence today. Be thou exalted. Begin to thank God for his encouragement. Begin to say, Father, I thank you. Thank you for encouraging me today. Thank you for encouraging me today. Lord, I stand in your encouragement. I stand in your encouragement. Lord, because you will do great things in my life. Lord, because you will do mighty things in my life. Lord, because I know that I, walk, I am walking into my testimony. Father, Lord, I am walking into my testimony. You are walking into your testimony today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are praying, O oh God, that you will receive all the thanks. Receive all the praise, receive all the adoration, receive all the glory. Even as the stars have come before in your presence, be thou exalted and be thou glorified. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we thank you. We bless your name, Jesus. We worship you. If you want to continue praying, I don't know if the prayer ministers are here today to so come up front. If anybody needs any prayer, just come to the prayer ministers and continue in the atmosphere of prayers. Open your mouth and begin to thank God. Father, Lord, we say thank you. We thank you for all the things that you have done in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you for today. We bless your name. Thank you for all the encouragement that you have given unto us. Father, Lord, you will bless us. You will do great things in our lives. We are praying that you will have your way in our lives. Be thou exalted and be thou glorified. Even as we go into the week, Lord, we pray that you will go with us. Father, Lord, we receive all the praise and receive all the adoration. In Jesus' name, we pray. May we share the grace and fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you all in Jesus' name. Our ministers are up front. If you need more prayers, praise the Lord.